Many decades ago, early astronomers and a lot of science communicators used to think of Earth as just some average planet around an average star, in a somewhat average location around the galaxy, suggesting that many such planets should exist out there, and suggesting that many such planets should have habitable conditions, with many potentially hosting different types of extraterrestrial life, or even some kind of extraterrestrial intelligence. But in the last couple of decades, we kind of discovered almost the opposite. Not only is Earth seems to be extremely different from a lot of other exoplanets out there, so is our Sun, and so is the place where we are in the galaxy. Meaning that this blue ball right here might actually be extremely rare compared to every other planet we've discovered to date. And with nearly 10,000 planets already identified and more or less confirmed by various missions, this actually makes it a pretty rare object. Nevertheless, there are some exciting planets that have been discovered so far that do have a slight chance to be maybe habitable and even potentially somewhat Earth-like or even hosting liquid water on the surface, with two that was just recently discovered being extremely interesting as well. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and so today we're going to be talking about this idea of potentially habitable exoplanets, we're going to discuss these two new discoveries, and also talk about the planet known as Kepler-442b that you see right here, that for many years now, the scientists always believed to be the most Earth-like planet we've found, but some of the recent studies actually argue with that. So let's discuss these concepts in more detail, and let's actually start with these new discoveries. And the first planet I wanted to take a look at was only found approximately a few days ago from when I'm making this video. Discovered by the TASS telescope and known as the planet Toy 1452b. Toy here stands for TESS Object of Interest. A planet that's very likely approximately 100 light years away from planet Earth, and was actually missed by some of the earlier surveys because this planet is located in a binary star system, and so some of the first observations did not actually recognize this to be a planet. And that's because normally in a binary system, as the two stars orbit around one another, they actually do produce quite a lot of dips, and these dips can kind of look like planets and can actually sometimes fool the scientists. And so in this case, the smaller dip around one of the stars was not seen right away. And in this case, these two stars also orbit around one another relatively closely, around 97 AU, which means that telling anything apart here is kind of difficult. But following a thorough analysis, one of the teams from Montreal was able to identify another dip around one of these stars. A dip that was caused by some kind of a planet that's about 1.6 times the size of planet Earth, orbiting around the star every 11 days. And normally this would be a problem, but in this case, because the star is a red dwarf, it actually places this particular planet right in the habitable zone of the star system. Which of course means that it has a very high chance to potentially have liquid water on the surface. But once again, because this is a binary, it actually is possible to use some of the variations in the orbits to then also determine the mass of this planet, which is what the scientists were able to do. In the process of discovering that this planet is maybe about 4.8 times as massive as planet Earth, which intriguingly give this particular planet very similar density to the density of planet Earth, around 5.6 gram per centimeter cube. Earth is about 5.5, which actually implies several things. First of all, this is a relatively dense object and is a terrestrial object, not some kind of a gas giant or some kind of a gas planet. But because of its relatively high mass, it also has a very high chance to potentially contain a lot of lighter materials as opposed to metals or different types of silicates. In other words, it implies that this particular object has a very high chance to be some kind of an ocean world. So kind of like one of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, such as Ganymede right here that has a very large ocean underneath, with about 30% of everything here being water, except that in this case it's a much much bigger object. It's a planet that's even bigger than Earth. And also unlike Ganymede or unlike Europa or other moons, because of its location around the star system, the ocean here would be liquid, making this planet at the moment the best candidate for a potential ocean world ever discovered. We've actually talked about some of these objects in some of the previous videos, there should be one somewhere right there or in the description, but in a nutshell, this planet right now has the highest chance of having a really huge ocean on the surface. And 30% is way way bigger than planet Earth. Here on Earth, the total mass of water is about 1% of the mass of the planet. And so potentially another interesting target for the James Webb telescope that can either confirm this or discover something else really intriguing in the process. Something we might learn about in the next year or so. So that's planet number one. Then there's another planet that was recently found, I guess about a week ago, described in a paper that you can find in the description. 
This one is known as Ross 508. And once again, this is some kind of a super Earth. Essentially a planet that's bigger and more massive than Earth by just a little bit, but not enough to be a gas giant. And so this planet, Ross 508b, is actually much closer, about 37 light years away from us. But what makes this planet interesting is the fact that it seems to have a very unusual orbit, where it essentially enters and then exits the habitable zone of the star because of its unusually elliptical orbit, making this a super intriguing target to study the potential habitability of these types of worlds. In this case, during its winter time, it might actually have liquid water on the surface, but then during the shorter summer time, the water might actually evaporate or at least disappear in some part of the planet. And once again, because the orbit here only takes approximately 11 days, and this is once again a red dwarf, this is still a very intriguing target in order to learn more about potentially habitable worlds outside of the solar system. And just like the previously discussed planet, this one is about four times as massive as planet Earth and is also slightly larger in size as well. Although what makes this discovery kind of exciting compared to the previous one is the fact that this is the first time ever the scientists found this by using infrared instruments on top of the Subaru telescope. In other words, this is the first planet ever discovered entirely by using infrared instruments, which once again means that James Webb here is going to be able to see this planet so much better because it's the biggest and strongest infrared telescope we currently have. And it also means that by using this technique, we can now identify even more similar planets, especially planets that are just too dim to be seen in optical light, but can still be detected using infrared, which is very often the case around red dwarfs. And the thing is, the vast majority of similar terrestrial planets so far have actually only been discovered around red dwarf stars. Mostly because these stars right here are basically like 90% of all of the stars in the galaxy. They're extremely common. G-type stars like our own sun are not as common at all. But several terrestrial planets have already been discovered around various red dwarfs, including the iconic TRAPPIST-1 system. There are like seven of them around that one star. And so the question has always been, are these actually possible around those stars? And more importantly, if there's going to be liquid water, is it actually possible for some kind of extraterrestrial life to then begin the process of photosynthesis to start creating oxygen and to potentially evolve more complex life? Or basically, like this picture indicates, is it possible for Earth-like conditions to exist elsewhere, around some kind of a red dwarf or some kind of a other type of a star? Well, first of all, in the last few years, there have been some really intriguing discoveries in regards to, well, essentially how photosynthesis works on the planet, and more importantly, how absolutely instrumental it has been to the evolution of the planet itself. Some of the videos about this are in the description below, but one of the more important discoveries is actually in regards to the mineral production on the planet. Over half of various minerals on Earth, the ones that are super important for life, or for chemical reactions involving life, have actually been created because of life itself specifically because of oxygenation and because of the oxygen produced by early bacteria. And because our planet had oxygen for nearly 3 billion years and a lot of this oxygen was able to produce a lot of these new minerals, all of this is super important for the evolution of more complex life. And naturally, the most effective way we know of to produce oxygen is through photosynthesis. And even though several types of photosynthesis exist even on planet Earth, only the one involving chlorophyll seems to be the most efficient one. That's the one that really took off on our planet. And so can it actually also happen on these other planets, including the ones discussed earlier? And there's at least one study that did a very thorough analysis of this last year. The study that's also in the description below. Here the idea was really simple. They picked a planet known as the most Earth-like planet discovered to date, Kepler-442b an exoplanet discovered back in 2015, and an exoplanet that's still believed to be most Earth-like object with the highest chance for potentially habitable conditions. Approximately 1.3 masses of planet Earth and about 1.3 times larger than Earth. But more importantly, a planet orbiting a star known as a K-type star. A type of a star that's a little bit hotter than a typical red dwarf, but not as hot and not as massive as our own sun. These are actually slightly more common as well. And more importantly, these stars usually are able to live at least 3 to maybe even 5 times longer than a typical G-type star. Some of these stars can even survive for about 30 billion years. And that of course gives them a long time to potentially evolve so many things on the surface of those planets. Which is why this particular planet is so exciting for a lot of different scientists. And so here the scientists wanted to calculate the amount of photosynthetically active radiation, PAR as it's also known, that a planet received from its parent star. 
Because even if the star is really bright, but it's not able to produce just the right amount of light for photosynthesis to actually take place, the chance for any complex life here decreases dramatically. At least the types of life we find here on planet Earth, and based on what we know about planet Earth as well. While also trying to figure out if any living organisms here would be able to produce enough nutrients and oxygen in order to survive and maybe even thrive on this planet via normal photosynthesis. And what they discovered is that, well, it would be extremely difficult for anything around this star and on this planet to be as productive and as efficient in photosynthesis as on planet Earth. Or essentially, it would be a huge struggle for any life here to photosynthesize enough oxygen. It would still be possible, but it would not be possible to sustain a rich biosphere. And that's around a K-type star that's also not as common as a red dwarf. Planets around red dwarfs, which have roughly around a third of the temperature of the sun, could not possibly produce enough energy to even activate photosynthesis. Suggesting that even if there is liquid water around these planets, the type of photosynthesis we expect around planet Earth would basically be impossible. Some other photosynthesis might be possible, but as far as we know it would not be nearly as efficient. On the other hand, the much hotter F-type stars or even B-type stars definitely produce enough light for photosynthesis to take place, but their lifespan is much shorter than G-type stars as well. And so the majority of more massive stars would have a lifespan of maximum 2 billion years possibly not enough to produce enough complex life. Whereas the stars that are smaller than the Sun, K-type and M-type stars, just don't have enough light to have photosynthesis. Once again making the Sun-like G-type stars the only known star to us that seems to be able to host these conditions. And in this case, in the study, they actually studied 10 potentially habitable exoplanets known to us around different kinds of stars, and unfortunately failed to find a single match for Earth-like conditions or Earth-like atmosphere. Although since photosynthesis began so early on planet Earth, we kind of expect to find it at least possibly somewhere. And so some of the K-type stars, including this planet Kepler-442b, still have a chance to have maybe some photosynthesis on the surface, but not a complex biosphere like planet Earth. It might be possible for some of the life here to create photosynthesis using longer wavelengths, around 800 nanometers or infrared light, but at the moment we don't really know of any such organisms on planet Earth. Any photosynthesis around Kepler-442b would have to rely on only red light. But it doesn't change the fact that they could still have liquid water. It just the water here would be most likely devoid of life or only have extremely simple life able to just produce a little bit of oxygen or a few chemicals here and there. Or potentially bacteria using some kind of a chemical reaction to produce all of the energy, similar to for example archaea here on planet Earth. Nevertheless, when it comes to Kepler-442b, at the moment, even though this is the most Earth-like planet discovered, the chance for complex life here, or possibly even any life, is extremely low. Some bacterial life might survive, very primitive life, but nothing too advanced, and definitely not something using photosynthesis similar to planet Earth. So chances are we're not going to be finding a lot of oxygen around this planet. And this, by the way, is going to be super exciting to find out in the future studies using James Webb Telescope, because this is definitely going to be one of its targets. But I guess until we discover something else, that's pretty much it. Subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.